Father, thank you for calling us here. And Father, um, you never come without bringing gifts. And the greatest gift you have is to give us yourself. And if we could see that, if we could taste you, Father, there would be a satisfaction that nothing could ever match. And so please give us a taste of you this morning as we look into your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 23, reading verses 8 through 17. There are some difficult names in here, but if I mispronounce them, you won't know because you don't know how to pronounce them either, right? Well, let's give it a try. It says this, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheb Bashabeth, a Tachamenite. He was chief of the three. He wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. And next to him among the, among the three mighty men was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, son of Ahohi. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. And next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hariite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot full of lentils, and the men fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines. And the Lord worked a great victory. And three of the thirty chief men went down and came about harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam, when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Raphaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water from, to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Then the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew out water of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and carried it and brought it to David. But he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord and said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. Now this story is soaked in love and relationship. It's heroism of the, the highest order. And it may not seem like it at first. These are violent men. These are men that are very familiar with killing and death. It's their way of life. But we have to understand this is not their preference. They are warriors because it's expedient. They live in a very violent culture and time. And if they don't defend themselves, they will be overrun and killed. It's that simple. So they have to respond in kind. That's why we have a military, right? To protect ourselves. And we should uh, note that God's preference is always peace. God does not want war. He prefers peace, but he doesn't, he's not opposed to it under all circumstances. Sometimes it's an appropriate response. Now, these are great soldiers, but that's not why they're great men. They're great because of their love and their loyalty that they showed to David. And that's the first thing that we see in this passage, is that great leaders inspire great love. Now David attracted very great men to follow him. And part of that was God's blessing. That these men saw God's blessing was on David, and it began long ago when he slayed Goliath, the giant that the whole army of Israel was afraid of, this boy, he was a 16-year-old boy at that time, he went and he slayed that giant. It wasn't even a close battle. He ended it in five seconds. And clearly people saw that and saw that God was with David. And the king at the time, King Saul, who God had called and anointed, who was not following God, and God said, I'm going to make you king instead, David. Saul knew that and tried to kill David many times. And he couldn't. The king wanted to kill David, and he couldn't. And so they saw God's blessings on David. So part of the men followed 
David because they saw God's anointing, his blessing was upon him. But part of it was because of David's own leadership skills. So they saw the character of David and they wanted to follow him. So twice, David had the opportunity to kill Saul. Saul is, he's on the run. David is in the wilderness on the run for his life because Saul is chasing him down. And twice, God gave David the opportunity. He could have killed Saul. He was already anointed David to be king. He could have gotten Saul out of the way by his own power. And David said, I can't do that. That's not right. God anointed that king, and I'm not going to kill God's anointed. And they saw that character of David, that he didn't take what was within his hands to take. And he said, they said, that's a man worthy to follow. And so they followed after him. Now, um, let's just be clear. David was not perfect, and the best among us are going to fail on a regular basis. And yet David was a man of great character and worthy to follow. Um, and because he led well, his men loved him, and they wanted to sacrifice for him. So they found out what he wanted, and they went and they got it for him at risk of their own life. Nobody told them to do that. No, David did not ask them to do it. He simply expressed a desire, and they acted upon it. Now, let's, let's um, have a little experiment here now. I love Diet Hansen soda. And clearly, my leadership skills need work, because nobody got up to go to the store right now, right? But should we try that again? No, no, no need. <laughs> Now, I, uh, let me just say this too. I think the best gifts, people give gifts, and the intention is always good if it's given with a good intention. But sometimes people give gifts, and it might be something that you're really not interested in at all. So the heart behind it was good, but if we want to give a gift, we should try to make sure it matches what the people want. So for example, yesterday we were here working at the school. They asked, we tried to do what they asked to do. We asked them, would you like this? We're not trying to force something that we want them to have on them. We want to find out what do they want, what do they need, and then we'll give it to them because that's the best kind of gift. So leaders have power. That's why they're leaders. And they're meant to use that power for the good of the followers, the people that are beneath them, that they're meant to serve them. And only if we had politicians that thought that way, and I, I'm sure we do have some, but not enough. Now David, in this chapter, before they tell this story, he's praying to God, and he's saying, God, this is what a leader who fears you is like. A leader that fears you and serves the people that are under him is like the sun rising in the morning. That's what the leader is like to the people that he, he's leading over. He's like rain that falls on the ground and makes things grow. Do you think of our leaders like that? that when you see them, it's like the sun shining on you and, and making rain to fall. That's the kind of leader David tried to be, and that's why his men responded the way they did. They loved him. Now, God is the greatest leader that ever was. And you know what he wanted? He wanted us. We were estranged from him. We were separated from him because of our sin. And he wanted us, and his son got his father what he wanted. He sacrificed himself to give the Father what the Father wanted, which was us. Amen? And so we see the second thing is that love means sacrifice. To love means to sacrifice. Now David's leadership inspired these men to love him. He was the leader, but he used that leadership to bless the men. He thought of them, and in response, they thought of him. Right? They sacrificed to get him what he wanted. You could say that they poured out their lives for him, right? They risked their lives. Death was a possibility in getting David this thing, and yet they didn't seem to mind. To them, it seemed a perfectly appropriate thing. And David showed his worthiness of their gift by refusing it, which may seem strange. It may seem insulting. These men risked their lives to give David this water. And he responds, not just saying, I'm not going to drink it. He pours it out on the ground, which may seem like he's doing the opposite of honoring it, but that's exactly what he's doing. He's basically saying, David wanted that water, didn't he? He wanted that water. 
and they risked their lives to give it to him. And then he refused to drink it. Why? Because he's saying, this, this water is equal to your lives because you risked your lives to get. I'm not worthy of that kind of devotion. I, it's, it's too good for me. You gave it to me, and now I'm going to give it to God. It's precious to me. I wanted this water, and it means so much to me that you would risk your lives to give it to me, but I'm going to honor you. I'm going to give it to somebody who's more worthy. This precious thing that I want, I'm going to give it away too. I'm going to honor you in that way. God's more worthy than me. Even though it means so much to me, God is more worthy. I'm going to give this thing that you gave to me, that you sacrificed to give me, I'm going to give it away to God because God is more worthy than I am. And so it wasn't an insult to what they'd done. He's honoring them, saying God is even greater than I am. I'm giving it to him. That's what I'm going to do with your sacrifice. I'm going to hand it off to him. So if love means sacrifice, then that means that we love by giving our best. This is, this is something that was precious to David. They, these guys risked their lives to get it. And now David is giving it away as well, not to shame them or insult them, but to honor them by giving it to somebody even greater than him. It may seem strange, but that's, that's what's happening here. That's just taking place. Now, God's most precious thing was his son. His most precious thing was his son. And his son was willingly sacrificed. Why? To get us. To get us, God willingly sacrificed his most precious thing. This water was precious to David. He wanted it. He loved it. And he gave it away. And God's most precious thing was his son. But in order to get us, he gave that to us. He gave us his son so that we could be with him. God's doing the exact same thing David did. But he's doing it for us now. That's how God got us. That's how he connected with us. Now, um, God has given us his best. His son was the best he could give. Do we give God our best? Or do we give God our leftovers? Do we make coming to church a priority? Do we make reading God's word a priority? Here's an afterthought. If we, when we look back at the week and say, you know what, wow, I didn't even read this at all this week. Did we even think about God? Did we even spend time alone with God in any way, shape, or form? God loves us. He desires to fellowship with us. And did we even give him the time of day? The question has never been, does God love us? Never. God loves us as much as is possible to. The question is, do we love God? Do we? And the answer is no. We don't. We, and I mean we don't love as we should. Yes, we might to a degree, but we don't love as we should. We can all do better. All of us can do better at loving God. And because he's given so much, it's appropriate that we do God shouldn't have to ask or demand it of us. He's given to us so generously that our response, just like these men, David didn't ask them to go get the water. They loved him so much because of all he did for them. They wanted to do that. Nobody told them to go do it. They were looking for a way to please this man, their leader. And so God shouldn't have to ask us, hey, can you please read this? I'm trying to talk to you. Would you spend some time with me? I want to bless you. You were made to fellowship with me. If you'll do that, you'll be more blessed than you can know or imagine. Should God have to ask for those things? Should he have to? Or should it just be our response? Because we see how much he loves us and gives to us. Amen? Now, um, if we think about that, that Jesus, he died for us, not because he had to, I mean, there was no other way for us to be connected with God than if Jesus died. But he didn't have to. He, he was under no obligation. If Jesus never came and died for humanity and we all ended up in hell, nobody would say Jesus didn't do what he should have done. He would have been perfectly within his rights to do that. Nobody, he did not have to do it. If he didn't do it, we were out of luck. That was the only way we're going to be connected with God. 
God wanted us and his son sacrificed himself to give his father what his father wanted. He gave up himself. So if we, if we look at this story, if we go back, it says that these men had military victory. God gave that to them. God gave them the victory. It says that David wanted this water. His men got that for him. And David took that water that the men gave him and he gave it back to God. And there's this cycle of giving and relationship that's going on. And it's not supposed to end. So Jesus died for us to give us our life, to give us our freedom. If you're a Christian, you should have experienced freedom. Freedom from guilt, freedom from uh, having to sin, freedom from shame. He took all that. We don't have to have that anymore. And it could stop right there. He, he's given that to us and we can say, I'm perfectly satisfied. I love having this stuff. I love being, getting my sins forgiven. I love not being a slave to the sins I was before. I'm perfectly content. And we could stop the giving right there. But it's meant to continue. That thing that he gave us ourselves, we are meant to, I shouldn't say meant to. If we're in this relationship properly, we will willingly give back what he gave to us and say, nope, you get it. The life that he gave us, that we could live selfishly for ourselves, we should do it. God, that's a precious gift. That's so precious. I'm going to give it back to you. I'm going to give myself that you died to give to me. I'm going to give it back to you. And you can do what you want with it. I, that's the most precious thing you've ever given me, my salvation. Freedom from sin, freedom from guilt. You gave that to me. And you know what? I give that life back to you. And the cycle keeps going. It could stop with us. But it's meant to keep going. And it's meant to be through us sacrificing ourselves, offering ourselves back to God. God, the most precious thing you gave me was the life of your son so I could be free. And rather than hold on to that, rather than drink that, I'm going to sacrifice it back to you. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to love you because you've loved me so much. And that's how I'm going to do it. And it has to be done willingly. That's the last thing we see. It has to be done willingly. It, it, it shouldn't be because we have to. Ah, i got to go to church. Pastor says, i got to go to church. Ah, I'm supposed to read my Bible. Okay, I'll read my Bible. Right? It's not meant to be that way. It's like, you know what? God, it would really make God happy if I spent some time in this book. It would make God really happy if I took five minutes and just thought about him and prayed to him and practiced trying to fellowship with him throughout the day. That would make him happy. And if he's happy, I'm happy because he did, has done so much and is doing so much for me. <sighs> There was, uh, we went to see um, Dr. Seuss play last night to see the wonder performance by C.C. Litzy, uh, stole the show. <laughs> she was great. But in it is a song, there's a, a character who's in a bad spot and he's saying, and he must have sang it like 50 times. I can't remember what he said though. How lucky we are. And he's saying, no matter what your circumstance, if you stop to think about it, you got a lot to be thankful for. A lot to be thankful for. We are so blessed. So blessed. And if we think about that, all that God has given us and our response to that, are they equitable? Are they, is our response appropriate for what God has given to us? Or is it really, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. If I think about it, how I've responded to God so selfishly, so, so selfishly. I'm not thinking of God. I'm thinking, I'm comfortable. I'm happy with that. But God's not happy. You know why? Because there's so many. God wants the world. He wants the world to know him. And we should not be satisfied until that happens. Because we can sacrifice ourselves to God. Say, God, I offer myself as a drink offering for you to use so you can get what you want, which is the people who don't know you. I know people that don't know you. I know some, God. And, and they need you. And I offer myself to you. I pour out myself to you. Use me so you can have what you want, God. You've given me what I want. 
You've given me yourself. You've given me salvation. Now I want to give back to you. I want to give to you, God. Not I have to. I, I love, you love me in a way that I don't deserve. And I want to love like you. And that means I'm going to give myself to you. And you can do what you want with me. Because I want you to have what you want, God. And what you want is those lost people. And I can play a part in that. I can play a role in that. I, I would be satisfied being satisfied myself. But God's not satisfied because there's still lost people out there. And I don't want to be satisfied if he's not satisfied. Amen? So let's make this really, really practical at this point. This is a lady named Jen Hatmaker. For real. We got a new timekeeper back there. You sure? For real? Okay. <laughs> One, okay. How am I doing? I'm okay. I'm all right. So let's give the new timekeeper a hand, shall we? Let's break his watch, though. <laughs> so let's make it super practical. This lady's name is Jen Hatmaker. I'll just tell you her story really quickly. She was the child of a pastor. She married a pastor. She was living the good life. She had a, a middle-class home, nice neighborhood, three kids. Um, they, were, they were doing good. And God pulled the rug out from under her and challenged her in how she's living her Christian life. And, and she was totally knocked off her socks by God. And she wrote a book about it called Interrupted, which explained how God is, was challenging her. You call yourself a Christian. Are you living like a Christian? Or are you living like an American? And it wasn't th those words. But I'm saying living according to your culture or you're living according to what God has called you to. And so she was challenged and, and she began these practices and she wrote a book called Seven, explaining how she responded to God's challenge in her life. And so seven represents seven disciplines that she began to practice. And the purpose was to, to question her own life. She was comfortable. She was okay. But was she really living as God called her to live? And so she sacrificed things. She gave up things to examine where was she at. And so the first month... Seven represented seven foods that she ate, only seven. And for one month, she ate those seven foods. And the second month represented seven items of clothing, not including her bibbidees, okay? So <laughs> there's seven clothes besides her undergarments. And, and a month, she lived like that. And it forced her to examine her own life and her, how she was content. And God wasn't content because... She ended up adopting, this is her family. Um, you can see there's two children with a really good tan that, that uh, were not hers by birth, but she adopted two children from a, a, a poor nation in Africa. And so this, all of this challenged her. And so I mention all this because I'm asking our leadership of this church to participate in seven. And we're going to begin in August. And we're going to all... now. Here's the thing. Seven is her description of how she responded to God's call on her life. And it isn't meant to be a, a system or a thing that applies to everybody. It, it's a, a catalyst. It's a starting point. So if somebody in the leadership team says, well, I'm going to eat these ten foods, that's fine. Or they say, I'm going to eat seven foods for a week. However, it, it's meant to be something between us and God. This is just meant to be a tool to get us started on that. And by sacrificing those good things that God has given us, we can focus on the real important thing, God, God himself, because all these things get in our way. They're not bad things, they're good things. But if I'm giving them more attention than I'm giving God, something's wrong. And I need to practice discipline. I need to say no. I need to say that's not a bad thing, but I'm looking after God, and if you food or whatever it might be are keeping me from pursuing God, that I'm telling you no to tell God yes. And so these books we're going to make available. Uh, they come in this week. You could sign up today if you want. It's, we're just going to charge you five bucks. It actually costs a lot more than that. But if you want to participate, I encourage you, read the book. Now, sometimes reading a book 
Oh, it's all God, a book. But th this lady's funny. I'm telling you, she's just like me. She's so hilarious. <laughs> Everything she says is, but it's easy reading. It's fun reading. And I think you'll actually enjoy it because she's real. She's only allowed to eat seven foods. And it can be frustrating and maddening. And she talks about that and the challenges that come with it. It's very engaging the way that she did. And it's very real. We're not pretending that we're anything better than we are. We're ordinary people that God has called to be superheroes by his power. We're not capable of it. We're not up to it. God will give us that gift. God will give us the power to do that. But that's what he's calling us to. Amen? So I encourage you to participate. You can sign up in the back. If you put your name, five bucks, you'll get the book. And you can join us in this participation where we are going to sacrifice ourselves to give to God and keep that flow going. You know what's going to happen if we give ourselves to God? God's going to take us and make us even better than before and give us back to ourselves again over and over. This cycle is meant to continue. This giving, this relationship should never end. And we don't want to be the point where that giving stops, where we say, I'm okay, I'm content, I'm going to keep what I have. We're going to keep that going. Amen? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you again for your goodness and your calling. And um, yeah, Father, being with you is it's such a pleasure, but it, it's painful too. Often you, you show us parts of ourselves that we wished weren't there or that we pretend aren't there or that we think are better than they are. And you're not doing it to discourage us. You're doing it because you really care about us and you want us to truly be who you always intended us to be. And so, Father, we're getting there. We're crawling there. I pray each one of us could continue to, to fight our way to you to crawl to you. And Father, may we respond to you uh, in a genuine way, Father, that we would have our hearts and minds open to the challenge that you have on our life. Maybe we all have something that we make too important. Help us to see that. Help us to be willing to sacrifice it because what we really want is you. And Father, you said if we have you, we get everything else too. It all belongs to us. So, Father, I just pray a blessing on us, uh, those of us who are just stumbling towards you, trying to hold on to you the best we can. We thank you for the grace and the help you provide. And, Father, I pray a blessing on these people. May we be a blessing. That was your intention all along. And all this, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.